Now that we know the general purpose, methods, curriculum of education, we can ask several questions more concretely about teachers. One, what specific techniques should they employ in teaching to achieve the goals, the methods, and the curriculum so far discussed? And then secondly, how do you train teachers? What is necessary to get teachers who can successfully deliver the goods? And then finally, the political question. Under what political system can we hope to get these people the good teachers and why don't we have them today? And so the three topics are on this center board. Teaching techniques, teacher training, and then the politics of education. Now first, teaching techniques. Now we're not talking about methods in the very broad sense, we've already given several lectures to that, but the techniques that will communicate and make real these methods and the subjects that we want to be taught. And here, as I've indicated on the board, there are two main rivals, lecturing versus the discussion method. By lecturing, we mean continuous talking by the teacher to the students, delivering material that is prepared in advance. The students essentially listen, take notes, perhaps occasionally ask a question, but that is a peripheral uh, phenomenon. By the discussion method, we mean dominantly talking by the students. Now, the teacher, in some sense, is to guide it. He may have a lesson plan. He may try to elicit specific material from the class. He may ask pointed questions and do whatever he can to maneuver the discussion toward a certain direction. But the basic distinction is in lecturing, the class is essentially silent. In discussion, the class is the dominant voice. Now, I can't hope to engender much suspense in you as to my view, <laughs> because I tipped my hand in my speech why Johnny can't think. When I went to school in my day and in the country of Canada, we had organized lectures from, actually from kindergarten on. Uh, the only time we had discussion, everybody moaned and groaned because it meant the teacher hadn't prepared and was killing the period. <laughs> In contrast, when I came to the United States, it was the rarest gem to find a lecture uh, in, in a college class. Now, despite my obvious and endemic prejudice to the discussion method, I'm going to try to be dispassionate at least give the veneer of fairness by giving an objective survey of the advantages claimed for each method, the problems, and then adjudicate. The single essential virtue of lecturing is this. The flow of material is controlled by a knowledgeable, trained mind in the field. That's the main thing to be said for lecturing. Ignorant novices, in other words, the class, do not shape the flow of the material. Is a motivation necessary? The teacher knows this. He knows what motivation is necessary. He builds it right into his lecture. He stays just long enough to establish it and then moves on. Are some data essential and some peripheral or irrelevant or overcomplicated? He knows this. He's the expert. He knows what is essential and what isn't. He decides it in advance. He doesn't waste time. He doesn't waste focus. He doesn't introduce needless confusion. He suppresses whole irrelevant bodies of data or useless extraneous blind alleys. He can give you the stripped down essentials. What integration should be made? When does a concept have to be broken down to its percepts? What is the order that is crucial? as against a class discussion <clears throat> in which unavoidably it is burdened with irrelevancies. You can't blame people who don't know the subject. If they knew what was, what was relevant, they wouldn't need the material. The class discussion is unavoidably, however well controlled, governed to some significant extent by random private associations, out of any logical order. The kids will jump too fast to a point, or take forever and go too slow. They'll be too concrete bound, or they'll be too floating. 
They'll jump in with too much or with too little, etc. All of those crucial questions of presentation which affect the ability to grasp the subject and the ability to grasp thinking methods, all of those have to be decided either by someone who knows the subject or by people who do not. And that is the essential difference between the two methods. Now, I think even to tutor an individual by the discussion method is very difficult. Very difficult. It can be done and it can have a value, but it's difficult. But to do it with a group, and a group who knows nothing about the subject, in my judgment, is hopeless. It leads to incredible boredom for the best students, tremendous amount of time wasting, uh, as everybody brings up irrelevancies out of any logical order. Now, of course, the discussion advocates who outnumber lecturing advocates 1,000 to 1 in the United States, the discussion advocates, scandalized by any such statement, say, we don't just say a random bull session. The teacher has to guide the discussion. He has to elicit relevant points. He has to be like the orchestra leader, and they're the band, you see. And my answer to that answer is, the only hope of real success in this guided method is if you have, if you're lucky to have a passive class. If your class, in effect, amounts to puppets, and you can pull the strings. But that really amounts to abandoning the discussion method. The class in such a context is not really initiating and following their own lead. They really come down to answering yes or no, while you are forcing leading questions down their throat. That is not a real discussion. That's a sham. It comes to this. If I come in and say, Columbus discovered America in 1492, that is rejected as lecturing, dogmatic, authoritarian, and so on and so. But if I come in and say, what do you think, Miss Smith? Did he discover it in 1492 or not? And she says, well, I feel he did. That's discussion. <laughs> now, I don't see any obvious advantage in that procedure. In my view, an actual discussion, not the sham form of it, is incompatible with teaching or learning effectively. Now, another objection that is raised to lecturing, and that goes like this. If lecturing by an expert is the right method, why do we even need his physical presence? Why doesn't he just write a book, lay the whole thing out with the right examples and the right integrations, point by point, etc., and grade it according to the level of difficulty of the students, and therefore, all the teaching should consist of, this is supposed to be the reductio ad absurdum, you see, of the lecturing view, all the teaching should consist of is a fabulous library and a librarian. And the kid comes in, you give him a reading list, and he goes in order through the various uh, uh, books, maybe with a question period every couple of months. Now, there are people who actually recommend this. They think that the live teacher is completely dispensable and that education should be a kid browsing through a library properly organized. Now, I don't think that that is a valid objection, nor a, an effective method of education in the early years. That is terrific when a kid reaches 15, when he has a certain basic grounding. Then I would say he's all ready, but not in the early years. So what is my answer to this, this problem? <clears throat> Certainly, reading is an invaluable supplement to education. But I think reading without live teaching it is very, very, very much harder to learn from a book than from a good lecture. Very much harder. Now, of course, if a teacher <clears throat> merely rattles off prepared material, which would be the same as just reading aloud, then a book could be just as good or could be even better, because at least you can stop in a book and go back. And you know you get teachers that if a teacher just rattles off prepared material, that's just like, and if you go on like that, there's no use having somebody live do it. You may as well take the book and read it yourself. <clears throat> that is not my idea of a proper lecturer. A good lecturer, even though his material is completely prepared in advance, does not simply deliver it. He constantly monitors his audience. He gets clues from them. <clears throat> at every moment, as to what they get and what they don't get, what they care about and what they don't care about, and he adapts his presentation on the spot to their requirements. 
He adapts the form of his delivery to the moment-by-moment requirements of the actual students in front of him. And no book can do this. For example, <clears throat> you lecture. You have a prepared material, and you see an expression of bafflement, widespread, or a frown that you didn't quite expect, or a murmur of surprise. Well, you immediately say, I've got to stop and do something. Something I expected to get through, and I see that it's not getting through. Maybe you have to slow down and repeat. Maybe you need a further explanation that you will extemporaneously ad lib until the frown disappears. Or you feel a sudden pocket of boredom in the room. The audience attention falls. You start to see yawns. You get, you know, the vibrations of, oh, this is all obvious. We already know this. So quickly you speed up. You drop out whole chunks of your prepared material and forge ahead. Or, you, if you think the context warrants it, you realize these people aren't really motivated. You thought they were, so you stop. And you say, why are you so bored? And then they'll always tell you why they're so bored. Because kids, <laughs> kids are very blunt uh, about that. You throw in a joke. You liven it up. You get them back on the track. A lecturer, in other words, has countless tools at his command to ease the flow of material into specific minds. He has tempo, emphasis, voice quality, gestures, pauses, volume, etc. A perfect example of that is the other day Professor Walsh was lecturing and he wanted to build up to the drama of the increments leading to revolution and he got his sweater and everyone was transfixed and he put it there and at the exact moment his voice was very quiet and at the exact moment that it fell he says comes the revolution <laughs> the sweater crashes to the ground the whole class is galvanized <clears throat> I mean you never forget it now that is excellent lecture <clears throat> That is something a lecturer, a good lecturer, can do that no amount of reading in a library can do. In other words, a lecturer not only can tailor his material to a specific audience, <clears throat> he can also make it an exercise in drama, color, urgency, emotional excitement as well. He can both inform and move his listeners. And of course, you learn much better if you can unite reason and emotion. It is virtually impossible for a textbook to do this, unless written by a genius, and I can't imagine what motive a genius would have to write a textbook. <laughs> Good lecturing can make a class an experience in theater, a gripping spectacle, and all of it adapted to the unique consciousnesses present at at the moment. So a book, in short, is aimed at a universal audience, any abstract rational mind. But a lecturer is much more concretely oriented. And this is why I think books will never replace teachers, nor will video cassettes uh, replace teachers, because they cannot monitor and adapt and give what is exactly required. A kid can read a book and be baffled, and the one moment of bafflement will wipe out the whole intelligibility, whereas a good teacher will see that frown and dissect it before you go any further, and it will be perpetual ease to grasp the whole material. Now, are there problems with lecturing or flaws? Well, I... One thing has often been said, it leaves students too passive. They don't learn to think, they just absorb. Now, I've really given you my answer to this objection. I've already covered how I think we learn to think, and that's by means of the method of the lecturer's presentation, the methods that he stresses in presenting the material. I do not believe that anyone learns to think. Now, get this. I do not think anyone learns to think primarily by talking aloud when he's ignorant. I do not think you can learn to think by talking aloud when you are ignorant. If you are ignorant, you learn primarily by listening, which is a hated word in America, by listening to a properly organized presentation. Now, I grant 
To some extent, there is certainly a value in speaking, even if you're ignorant. It gives you a chance to marshal your thoughts, organize your ideas such as they are, grope for formulations, and so on. But I believe that this type of verbalizing on your own is much more effectively done in writing at home for the very reasons that I mentioned in the discussion of writing, where you have lots of time and no pressure to perform or show off, and where your chaos and confusion does not waste everybody else's time. <clears throat> so I don't think it's a valid objection that the educational methods that I advocated inculcate passivity, not if conjoined with massive doses of writing at home, which are then analyzed on an individual level. Now, there's a more valid objection, however, to pure lecture, which does have something to it, which goes like this. A lecturer, even one who monitors carefully, and what we're having here, let's face it, is lecturing, not teaching uh, in, in the full sense, because we have a short amount of time, a gigantic class, so you get a lecture and then a hit-and-run question period and disappear. <laughs> so this is an example. A lecturer, even one who monitors carefully, has a very limited insight into the student's mind. It's only what he can glean from external evidence. I mean, if I see your eyes glaze over, I hear a lot of shuffling and coughing and so on, I know something is wrong. But I don't really, as a lecturer, get inside your consciousness. I don't really get the complete data. Do you get what I'm saying or not? And sometimes, as you'll know if you're an experienced teacher, the external evidence can be grossly misleading. I have had many instances where I have students sit in the front, they nod at all the right points, they beam, they give you every evidence that they're motivated, they understand it, they're just eating it up. And you would go into a catatonic stupor if you read their exams. They have no clue what it's all about. <coughs> there are students who learn to nod like Pavlov's dog. <laughs> so, the argument is, if you really want to check on the, what the students know, you have to probe. You have to question them. You have to find out. You have to let them talk. And the more they talk, the more you find out. And therefore, we're plunged into the discussion method. Now, the discussion method is the exact reverse advantage or disadvantage of the lecturing method. <clears throat> the virtue is that it is very revealing to the teacher of the student's consciousness. Their questions, their comments, unmistakably reveal their motivation, their interest, their understanding, their errors, their confusions, and it gives you that information in a way that simply observing them cannot do. But the fatal vice, nevertheless, is what I've already indicated. However well the discussion is guided, it has an inherent tendency to become chaos, subject switching, arbitrary assertions, concrete boundedness, etc. That is inherent in the fact that the initiative is being taken by the ignorant. And the result of such class discussions is it instills in the class the conclusion that knowledge is simply a process of wasted, boring, endless talk, that it's all subjective, that nobody knows anything. Ten years of class discussion is a recipe for training skeptics. You'd have to be the most unusual genius to emerge from that kind of schooling as anything else. Now, it's true that some discussion leaders are better than others. There are brilliant discussion leaders who are highly skilled in this method. They can take the farthest out question and field it. The kid feels he's being answered, and yet you're still back on the track. Uh, they, can, uh, they can orchestrate the most divergent comments. Uh, they can dominate the process so that they minimize the damage. But in my judgment, the most they can do is minimize the damage. They can't remove it. So I am not an advocate of what is called the, quote, Socratic method. Certainly not as general education. Not in the primary schools or the secondary schools or the undergraduate schools even. 
I do think that what's called the Socratic method or the tutorial is valuable in certain contexts for advanced students. I've used it myself. But it does presuppose that the student has a wealth of knowledge, so he's not just ignorantly jumping around. He's got a foundation for his comments and his explorations and his questions. And I do not think you can do it successfully in a large group, because even one or two people have already divergent, very divergent directions that they want to go. And if you get too many different perspectives, it just sprawls into nothing. Now, I have found that you take a couple of bright kids who really know objectivism, for instance, and then give them an advanced tutorial, it's much better at a certain point. It's essential for them to talk, for them to discuss, for them to ask in the real standard discussion method, because now they have the foundation. But to beginners or comparative beginners, it's a waste of time. They don't know how to discuss. They're too ignorant. And so it comes down to, what do you think, Ms. Smith, objectivism says about the intrinsic? And she says, well, I don't know. I feel that Ayn Rand says this and some. No, I feel she says, that is a complete throwaway. And to charge money for that is a fraud, in my opinion. <clears throat> now, the actual reason, of course, for the prevalence of the discussion method of the United States has nothing to do with Socrates. That is a cover-up. It's because that's the method of skeptics and subjectivists. That's the idea of the group above reality, which is today's dominant philosophy, thanks to Kant and Dewey. All right, now let's try to adjudicate this issue. And here, as in just about everywhere else in education, I think we can find a false alternative. <clears throat> because let's look at a pure lecture. The class is completely silent. He is concerned to simply deliver the material and takes limited cognizance of the consciousness of his students. He gives you the facts, the data, and in effect he hopes that it enters and takes root. The discussion method, on the other hand, is very concerned with self-expression, with consciousness expressing itself, but thinks that you don't have to have knowledge or reality for that purpose. Now here again we have, in connection with such a topic as techniques, the same basic dichotomy of what? The intrinsic versus the subjective. It's a form of that same dichotomy. Because the pure lecturer typically organizes his data and wants to pour it in the student's mind, more or less viewed as a passive receptacle. And the pure discusser wants the minds of the students to guide the process, wants consciousness to be in charge apart from data of reality. Now here again, as in all others, I think, objectivity is the guiding, or should be the guiding, solution. The proper union of existence and consciousness, of data and of the student's awareness. And this is what I call, for lack of a better name, lecturing in chunks. And let me briefly indicate to you, that is my resolution of this dichotomy. In this method, first of all, the teacher or the parent or the communicator does have a full lecture prepared. He decides in advance from his knowledge of the field and the students what motivation to supply, what context to count on, what data are essential, what structure to follow, when to generalize, when to concretize, what examples are the best, etc. He has all the advantages of the lecture, and he actually does deliver his lecture in the right order just as he pre-prepares it. But the difference is this. It is punctuated now and again by intervals of controlled class discussion. It is punctuated periodically by intervals of controlled class discussion. Now, the first question is punctuated when? And here I would say not as decided by the students. Definitely not. As decided in advance by the lecturer as the material permits. The teacher has to, in my opinion, Divide up the total lecture into units, like a book into chapters. Units which are relatively self-contained, which are like logical stopping points, subsections or divisions of his total point. The lecture is in effect carved up into three or four different issues. And usually these are very easy to find. Where do you think you get them? From your original structure that you worked out. You usually will have three or four, and those will be your self-contained uh, points. Each point should be such 
that you have to grasp it in total before there's any interruption. It has to be developed as a whole, the beginning, the middle, the end. And until the class gets that point, it does not have enough knowledge even to start asking questions or making comments. In effect, each chunk is like an atom, you know, an indivisible amount of the lecture. And if you break that atom, then the student loses the point. Now, it's impossible for me to quantify how many minutes. It depends on the material, the audience's knowledge, and many other things. But approximately 10 to 15 minutes a chunk is my rough working unit when I'm teaching ordinary people and not objectives. If you have too many chunks, like every two minutes you're going to stop, it disintegrates the whole class, then you can't do it. During the development of one unit or one chunk, I permit no interruptions because it's a very delicate business. It has to be exactly structured. Every element is needed. You cannot let the class interfere. If they bring in the wrong question or the wrong observation at the wrong time, they can wipe out the whole preceding material, just confuse everybody and throw them off. So there is a point where it is now get this, too early to let your students ask a question. Even too early to let them ask that they're unclear. Now I first discovered this from Ayn Rand. I was brought up with the idea. If ever you are unclear about any sentence that a teacher says, you should stop right there and say, I don't get that. And when I first did that with uh, Ms. Rand, you know, and she would give me answers to questions, and she'd give a paragraph or two, and I'd say, I don't understand this point. Time after time, she'd say, well, of course you don't understand. You didn't let me finish. <coughs> and I was baffled by that for quite a while until I grasped the point that there is such a thing as integration, as a total, which makes any given unit within it clear. And that uh, if you ask certain questions at the wrong time, you make learning impossible. Whereas if you keep quiet, you even learn to endure momentarily the fact that you don't get something, very often, if it's a proper presentation, a few minutes later, you retroactively get it. So, in these units, I don't allow interruptions because the students are confused. I don't allow it because they're not interested. I don't allow it for anything. Reality in that moment sets the terms. And you have to say to the students, in effect, right now, you shut up and listen. I know better than you what you need to hear at this moment. And this is where the uh, idea of children should be seen and not heard has a valid application. But now, once the unit has been presented, then I think some controlled discussion is valuable. Now, it's impossible for me to say what should be the ratio of discussion to uh, material because it depends on the quality of the discussion and where are you getting and how much time do you have for the total syllabus how confused are the students, etc. But on a rough average, I try to make it one to three or four. That is three or four minutes of lecturing to one minute of discussion. So in an hour class, I try to aim for 10 to 15 minutes of discussion. Other things being equal. Now by discussion, I don't mean you sit back and say, okay, your turn now. Yes, Miss Smith, yes, no, yes. Not like that. I mean a very controlled, delimited discussion for four purposes, and only those four. Number one, motivational. You have to gauge the student's motivation. And if necessary, you have to supplement it. If you see they're not too interested, you've got to come in right away and find out why. And one terrific way of doing that, if they're not interested, let them tell you why not. Let them make the best case they can as to why this material is not worth knowing. And I, I tell the classes, if you can give an argument that I can't answer as to why this material is not worth knowing, it's automatic A in the course. You don't have to write any exams. You don't have to take the course. Of course, I have to count on the fact that I can refute their argument. <laughs> Second, a cognitive purpose. Uh, you have to check, are they grasping the material? Are there any questions of clarification? Now is the time for it. Are there any errors you can see running through their comments? Are there any points that need review because their grasp seems a bit shaky, etc.? Thirdly, exploratory. I do allow a bit of freewheeling. 
You know, they let them jump all over the map because within limits it has a value. And that is, it lets them get a glimmer of the connections between this unit and all the rest of what they're doing. What further questions are there? What further applications? Where else does this subject go? And it gives them a chance to grope for their own uh, conclusions. That's okay if that's an, a, a peripheral purpose. And then finally, what I call R&R. In other words, it's like the commercial and TV. It's the time to let the, your focus down. I do not believe that people can focus optimally. Certainly not kids. Hour after hour after hour, they just can't take it. So I look at it like this. It's a 10 minutes of pressure buildup where you're extorting the full of their faculty of focus and then a little while to let them let off steam and laugh and shuffle and, you know, it doesn't make too much difference if they don't pay too much attention to what the other students are saying. You know, so there's a certain element of that too. Now, as I say, the amounts are variable. The, the amounts of time uh, given to these periods, it depends on the class, the subject, the circumstances. But I conclude this point nevertheless by saying that although I give this, let's call it concession, to the discussion approach, it is only as an adjunct to the lecture method. The discussion functions as a supplement to what the, a good lecturer does anyway. Observe the audience and then adapt. It permits you, though, a deeper penetration into the student's mind. Nevertheless, lecturing is still the primary. The discussion is merely a perfecting of what you basically are accomplishing by the lecture method. And that's why I regard myself as essentially in the lecturing camp, albeit with this qualification. <clears throat> now, if you're going to practice this, I just want to warn you in conclusion of this point, <clears throat> it is very tricky in practice to keep the right balance, not to let the discussion swamp the lecture. You have to keep the momentum of your ideas and your presentation going. You are going to get all kinds of weird comments because they come out of left field because that's where the kids are and they don't know the material. You're going to have hostile students who are threatened by what you say. Not all of them, of course, hopefully not most of them, but certainly some of them. There is always somebody virtually who takes personally something you say and is outraged. There are frightened students who don't dare speak and you want to try to get them involved. And you have to do all this while moving fast enough not to bore uh, the bright ones and slow enough not to lose the dumber ones. Now, if you get a teacher like this, you are very lucky. It's a very, very skilled uh, technique, although not one learned in college. But that is what I regard as the objective technique as against the intrinsic or the subjective. That's all I want to say on this first, which you'll be happy to know is the longest of our three points. Now, I revealed my view of teacher training institutions, teachers' colleges, in the talk, Why Johnny Can't Think. And I want just to take a moment to reread one paragraph, or to read one paragraph, which I stand by completely. There is no rational purpose to teachers' colleges. And so they do little but disseminate poisonous ideas. Teaching is not a skill acquired through years of classes. It is not improved by the study of psychology or methodology or any of the rest of the stuff the schools of education offer. Teaching requires only the obvious, motivation, common sense, experience, a few good books or courses on technique, and above all, a knowledge of the material being taught. Teachers must be masters of their subject. This, not a degree in education, is what school boards should demand as a condition of employment. Now, I, I think I told you at the outset of this course I had scandalized comments on this. And the best objection that I got came down to, not valid, but I mean the most plausible one, came down to, you're inconsistent. You gave a whole course on communication years ago. You're giving a whole course on education. Now, you spend years thinking about these things, and then you say, who needs it? It's just common sense. So the, these people that write me these enraged letters say, okay, the teachers' colleges are no good, but they're no good in any subject. But we don't say close down medical school, therefore, but do a better job. And why don't you say the same thing for teachers' colleges? I'm going to give a brief answer to this. 
To decide whether a teacher's college has a legitimate function or not, you have to ask, what skills does teaching require that can be reduced to a body of knowledge and taught? What skills does teaching require that can be reduced to a body of knowledge and taught through courses? Now, teaching obviously requires many things that cannot be taught in uh, a, 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 an educational institution. For instance, teaching requires motivation. You have to have the desire to teach. But a school of education does not give you a motivation. It presupposes it, or it would presuppose it. Teaching requires common sense, it requires experience, it requires knowledge of the subject matter. None of this comes from a professional school of education, not even an objectivist one, if such were to exist, and I would maintain it could. Well, now let's get to some more plausible candidates. Does good teaching, you might ask me, require a knowledge of psychology, which, after all, can be taught? I mean, theoretically, if there was somebody to teach it. I say it does not. I do not think good teaching requires a knowledge of psychology. I consider myself a good teacher. I am ignorant of psychology. There have been many brilliant teachers who know zero about the cure of neurosis, or the dynamics of psychosexual development, or the needs of the unconscious, or the causes of homosexuality, or the problems of self-esteem, etc. By the same token, there are many psychologists who know or claim to know all of these things inside out and yet are hopeless teachers. There is no relationship at all between knowledge of psychology and ability to teach. If you want to call it psychology, I would say there's only two things out of psychology that a teacher has to know. That men have to be motivated in order to learn and that they can only understand what is logical. But obviously, you do not require a course in psychology to grasp those points. Now, I hasten to say I am not derogating the crucial importance of psychological knowledge. I know that these pot shots periodically may add up in your mind to some kind of anti-psychological bias on my part. I don't think that is true. I have the greatest respect for psychology. And I think if you are a therapist or you are in any way concerned with the subconscious, you are trying to change it or get a response from it or probe its contents or whatever, terrific. God be with you. The more you know, the better. But teaching is not concerned with the subconscious. It is aimed at consciousness, at the intellect. It is concerned with the communication of knowledge and intellectual methods. If the potential student is so sick mentally that you cannot address his consciousness as such, then... In other words, you can't treat him as a rational being able to think, then he is unteachable. He is outside the domain of the teacher and of education. And it is a complete corruption and confusion of function to mix those two. And I'll give you a perfect analogy stolen from the Greeks. You do not have to be a medical doctor to teach football. You assume when you teach football, a healthy body and then you teach specific conscious motions. If the player is too sick physically, he has a broken leg, and he can't get the lesson, you send him to a hospital or to a specialist to get him in shape where he can then benefit from your instruction. And the same goes here. In teaching, you must assume a mind that is capable of functioning. If not, get the kid out of the class and into a hospital or therapy or a home for the retarded or whatever it is. Now, I think that so-called educational psychologists today are literally destroying teaching by trying to turn teachers into amateur psychologists who are concerned with the subconscious of their charges while ignoring their minds. You know, in this whole gimmick, you no longer bother whether Johnny got a C in French or a D or an A. You try to find out does he have an inverted Oedipal regression or not. And that's what you put on the report card, and that's what the teacher is focused on. Now, I regard that as incredibly vicious, destructive BS, to give a technical term for it. <laughs> Psychology is very valuable in its place, but it's very harmful if it's not kept in its place. These, these educational psychologists do more harm than any one aspect of the teacher's training. 
Well, now then, let's go to the question. Does good teaching not require a knowledge of methodology? Methodology. That's the other big thing that teachers' colleges teach. One half is psychology and one half is, quote, methodology. Well, what is methodology? Well, if you mean the junk taught in teachers' colleges under that name, then it's irrelevant. By methodology as taught today, they mean arbitrary trivia, utterly concrete bound, formalized into useless systems. For instance, there's a methodology of being a janitor. There's a methodology of teaching janitorial science. There's a methodology of analyzing the concepts that are involved in teaching janitors. And there's an entire curriculum of the pedagogy of janitorialism. <laughs> and that's one of the deeper aspects. <laughs> there's only one basic method or methodology that has to be known by a good teacher. And that is the method of what? Thinking. How to be logical, how to hold the context, how to respect the hierarchy of knowledge, how to abstract and integrate, and so on. Obviously, definitely without question, you need this kind of method in order to teach. But the point is you need it to do anything at all other than manual labor. It is not a need distinctive to teaching. And it is not the preserve of some special school for teachers. Thinking has to be learned, but my whole point in this course is it should be learned in grade school as part of becoming educated. That's the whole purpose of education, as we've seen. A proper education is a decade-long training in how to think, in the conditions, the processes, the methods of thought. If you do not get it from years of a proper general education and or from your experience of life by the time you reach adulthood, believe me, you are not going to get it from a special graduate school for teachers. I could go on and on, but I won't. <clears throat> I just want to make this qualification. I can see the value of a few books for a potential teacher. Even to be generous to my opponents, a few courses. Primarily giving him tips as to how to apply the thinking methods he already knows to the teaching situation. But there is not that much to say on this topic, in my opinion. And all these courses of mine that people were commenting on as being contradictory on my part, communication, and including this course of education, if you analyze the content, you will see that they are far in excess of 50% pure epistemology. They are pure discussions of objectivity and integration and context keeping and hierarchy, all of the stuff that people should get in regular uh, education. If I extracted from this one course, as an example, everything that was pure philosophy and discussed only that which applied specifically to education, you would be amazed how little you'd get for your money. <laughs> now, this is a tremendous difference from such fields as medicine or law, for instance where there is a vast specialized knowledge, where common thinking methods, or philosophy in general, is not enough. Teaching is not comparable to these fields. It is not a complex, specialized subject in that way. And in fact, you don't even have to know epistemology as such. It is possible to be able to think clearly, assuming you have a decent upbringing, even without knowing the formal theory of thinking. So I reiterate, what a good teacher requires, aside from thinking ability and knowledge of his subject, is enthusiasm for his subject, the desire to make it known. Thereafter, what he needs is experience and intelligent reflection. That's how I learned teaching and how anyone else that I know did, and that's all that's required. I say close down the schools of education. At most, a one-year post-high school course on practical advice, some elementary things, tips on motivating, how to give exams with the least pain, discipline problems, how to organize your curriculum, a few things like that. But believe me, not uh, years of study. I hope that answers. Finally, this question has been plaguing me for two years. Now, finally, let us look at briefly the last point that I wanted to make in this course, the political context of the whole topic. Our schools today are terrible. 
Why? Not just why philosophically now, but politically. Why don't we have today the kind of teachers, or more broadly, the kind of education that we should? What kind of society makes possible a good education, and what kind destroys it? Now, there can be exceptions to a trend within limits. You can have a good school, believe it or not, even today, so long as it's an exception on the periphery. If somehow the people involved can circumvent all the regulations and the double taxation and the compulsory schooling laws and the teachers' unions and the bureaucratic requirements, if I, I think it's still physically possible to bootleg some good school somewhere uh, today, but that has to be the exception by the nature, and we're talking about the dominant trend. So, talking in principle, what kind of society makes possible a good education? And I say the answer lies in Ayn Rand's principle that reason and freedom are corollaries, and so are faith and force. Reason and freedom. You know this point, I'm sure. If reason rules men philosophically, if that is what they treasure, admire, respect, exercise, then they will naturally insist on leaving men free to think and act accordingly, and we will end up with an individualistic, free, capitalistic society. And of course, once men are free, then the best among men in all fields will rise to the top, including in the field of education. The men most committed to thought and conceptual training will ultimately set the terms. Now, how long the ultimate is depends on the state of philosophy. Freedom doesn't guarantee a correct philosophy right away. But ultimately, it will set the terms, the, the best men, for two reasons. Practically speaking, because they will demonstrate their value in the marketplace. There won't be a state monopoly of education. There will be competing schools. And the better the educator, the more his students will get the good jobs, achieve the successes, make money, live a happy life. Whereas the other schools, the anti-conceptual schools, will turn out perceivable failures, dolts, and neurotics, and they will simply lose out on the marketplace. Now, this is plain capitalism. The better mousetrap will win out in the end if men are free. And in education, better means conceptual. And by the way, you do not have to be an objectivist to judge this issue. To explain it, you do, but to judge it, you don't. People on all levels can tell what's going on in education today, even though they have no idea why. And they are flocking to something like Montessori, although they don't know why, because they can see it does something. Now, I said there was two reasons why a, a conceptual education will be the ultimate product of a free society. The deeper reason is, is this. Reason is the motivating premise of a free society to begin with. This is what leads to freedom politically. This is what men are imbued with. And therefore, this is what they are one way or another going to end up teaching their youngsters. And reason means the exercise of thought, the conceptual faculty. In other words, the same basic premise that leads to freedom will lead to a pro-reason, pro-conceptual education. Now, the same thing works in reverse. Unreason or faith and force are corollaries. If men reject reason, they have no way to deal with one another or resolve disputes except ultimately by coercion. And they don't see anything wrong with this any more than we see anything wrong with using force on wild animals. You have to use force where reason is inapplicable. And of course, the final expression of that is going to be some kind of statism. Institutionalized force by the government. And once you have statism, then, anti-thought, obedience, conformity, rises to the top. The whole system rests on the idea that the individual should efface himself, keep quiet, obey the leader. So you have unavoidably an anti-mind atmosphere. Practically speaking, because of the status monopoly, the best educators are throttled. Mediocrity is entrenched in the field. You have the socialization of education, and it works exactly like the post office for exactly the same reason. There is no competition possible, and so it's a, a direct invitation to stagnation, mediocrity, complete indifference to the actual function of the institution. 
And a mind outside the system has, practically speaking, no chance to uh, compete or even to get a foot inside the system. And we are approaching that now, as evidenced by the difficulty of even getting a teaching job in the humanities if you don't subscribe to today's orthodoxy, let alone getting into the schools if you don't go through the unions. The deeper cause, of course, as to why you're going to end up with an anti-conceptual education uh, in a state of society is because the basic philosophy which led to statism will emerge in education as well. An active antipathy to the mind was the root that led people to have the all-powerful state. That's its motivating premise, and that is certainly going to show up in the schools in every possible way. Now, in the United States today, that anti-mind, that antipathy to reason, is the Kantian philosophy. Reality is unknowable. Truth is what the collective decrees. The most important thing is conformity. And today, you can see education in the United States is really faithful, unbelievably faithful to this underlying philosophic premise, the very premise that led us to a collectivist society. Because we not only have generalized adulation of the group, we have now reached the unprecedented and abysmal depths of a having pressure group schooling. Not only group schooling, but pressure group schooling. We have female studies classes and black classes and Chicano classes and bilingual classes. We have the utter collapse of the curriculum of objectivity, of principles, in favor of balkanized feuding groups, each trying to seize the student and inject their propaganda, each proclaiming proudly how subjective they are, and each concerned to give the students their version, and their version is always and only the concretes of their particular heritage and alleged achievements. And now bring in another element. I've just been talking about epistemology and politics. Between epistemology and politics, as you know, is what branch of philosophy? Ethics. Between unreason and statism is what specific ethics? altruism. I assume you know that. And you must know also from Ayn Rand that it has to lead in the end to its extreme, consistent version, which is egalitarianism. In other words, the hatred of the good for being the good and the reward of the incompetent for being incompetent. And this, too, has now reached its climax in education in countless unbelievable ways. One obvious one is the collapse of entrance requirements. The idea that it is immoral for a student to have to know something in order to pass from grade two to grade three, he has just as much a right to be in grade three as anybody else, or to be a brain surgeon, or to do anything. It's, a, it's, it's unfair to demand knowledge because that violates equality. But of all of the things that I could regale you with, the horrors of egalitarianism in education, to me, the bottom of the pit is what they call the mainstreaming of the handicapped. We mean here not just the physically, but the mentally handicapped. This is mandated by federal law now. They spend up to 10 times per handicapped student what is required for a regular student and require that he not be treated in separate schools uh, suited to his particular mental maladaption. He must be mainstreamed. In other words, you have to take these kids, maybe through no fault of their own or through accident or whatever, they have fits, they fall on the floor and scream in the middle, they ha make weird noises consistently, they are in a complete other dimension and by federal law they must be sat in the middle of regular classes, otherwise the students, the, the uh, schools are cut off from uh, federal subsidies. You try and imagine conducting a class in which you have freaks of this kind mandated to be the center of attention by the federal government, 
And in the name of egalitarianism, why should the fact that the kid is mindless or retarded uh, deprive him of uh, Latin and Greek, or since they don't teach that, of finger painting and basket weaving, uh, like everybody else? It is the deliberate, willful sacrifice of the mind to so-called need, the flaw, the mindless. And the educators today don't even make any bones about it. They write in their journals that the plight is, how can we have excellence and equity? And they say, we can't. It's a choice of excellence versus equity. Either we have standards in education, in which case we are immoral, because we are depriving those who don't live up to the standards of equal education. Or we collapse all education to the lowest common denominator, in which case everybody gets it, but what they get is garbage. And there's no, they don't know the solution. And they say this is one of the eternal problems of life. As I've heard it put, quality versus equality. Well, it's really true. That is a dilemma no philosophy is going to un uh, undo. You do have to choose. You absolutely have to choose between quality and equality given their definitions. It is either or. And of course, the particular choice that the educators are making today follows unavoidably from their ethics, which itself follows from their anti-reason. Now, the first thing to go in this kind of egalitarian atmosphere is obviously a conceptual approach to education. A conceptual approach takes tremendous work, commitment, dedication. It does not happen automatically. If you leave men to simply what happens automatically, then what happens? You have recourse only to your perceptual functions. If educators ignore conceptual training, even leaving aside that they hate it, all that will come to replace it will be exactly what we have today. A hodgepodge of perceptual concretes and blind memory in no order with no message. If you see this overall picture, you see you should see from politics back to ethics, back to epistemology, and all of that leads unavoidably in countless different ways to the collapse of education. It's a straight line from the critique of pure reason to Johnny who can't think. A straight, tragic line. Well, now some people think we're in a hopeless situation once we've reached this. I've heard it put to me, isn't it a chicken and egg situation? Because you need the right government to get better schools, which are made impossible virtually with all of today's restrictions. And yet you need better schools to get a better government. Otherwise, where are the properly educated politicians going to come from? So I am asked time and again, which comes first, better politicians or better school teachers? Neither. Both of those are effects. If they come at all, they're going to come together. What has to come first is their root, which is philosophy. Ayn Rand once said it is philosophy. I forget her exact words, but the idea is that God is into this state. It is only philosophy that is going to get us out. First, you have to launch a purely philosophical campaign aimed at a small, dedicated nucleus of intellectuals who go to the core of a society's irrationalism and fight for a renaissance of reason. And then, as and when you get a foothold in the universities, you make forays, raids, applications in both directions at once, in the direction of better government and of better schools. And then, hopefully, you will start a virtuous circle and each will help the other. If the philosophy departments lay the groundwork, gradually we can hope there will be better political candidates and better school teachers coming up. And the candidates will uh, make the schools gradually freer, let's hope if they're better and better, and the teachers will make each decade's politicians a bit more rational, and they in turn will make things a bit freer, and so on. 
And this, as I understand it, is exactly what we're trying to do now, using objectivism as the base. And the Ayn Rand Institute, it is part of this process. It is a long, bleak process at times, but I do think that we have a, ch a chance of succeeding. And you all, simply by virtue of attending here, if for no other, and I know there's many other capacities, are a part of this battle. If you want to, you are helping reason, if I can put it in those terms, to win out historically by the sheer fact of your presence. So I want to take this uh, opportunity to thank you all most sincerely for attentiveness to this course. Now I declare this course closed. Thank you very much. I have, believe it or not, a few written uh, questions, but they do not pertain to... Oh, one does pertain to education. But first, let me take some from the floor. Hopefully on, to, on this material that we just covered. Yes. Would you please comment, including your preference, on lecturing from an outline versus from an explicit text? What is my preference on lecturing from an outline rather than from an explicit text? Which was I doing in this course? <laughs> well, I tell you, an explicit text has the great advantage that you know exactly what you're going to say. So if your mind goes blank or you forget or you, get, you stumble, it's all there. It has the disadvantage of being canned and of being harder to keep inter interspersing ad-lib comments. So what I prefer is uh, a cross. I have basically a written text, but you never know it from reading the notes. I don't have just an outline. I have anything where I think I might go wrong written. And all the rest just indicated very briefly. And of course, the more you know, the, the less notes you have to have. And so the idea is, uh, you, you deliver, you have your crutch for where a definition might come in that you want to get exact or an example uh, is indicated and so on. But you have the freedom, once you know the material, to be uh, more ad-lib. So it's about half and half. I also think that you can get away with a completely prepared text if you're a good actor. There are techniques for disguising the fact that you're reading. Nothing is more deadly than to get up before a class and say, da -da 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 -da, just reading like that. You have to watch them. But there is a way of doing that same, which is completely written out without the class knowing you're doing it, by looking at them, taking in a few more words and looking at them, pausing as though you're trying to think of what comes next. And they actually think it's extemporaneous. They like it much better. And there's a deeper reason for that. So I would, in effect, say a combination here. Yes? Just read a little bit of what you use as notes, for example. Could I read a bit? Well, I don't know uh, what part. Uh, it says, for instance, S-O-L-N question mark, chicken. <laughs> then it says G-O-V-T and uh, uh, teach. And that tells me, what's the solution, S-O-L-N? Some people see it as the chicken and egg situation that you have to have one and not the other. They think you have to have the government first. See, it's just enough, you see. So uh, you don't write it all out, but now if I'm giving it the very first time, now the very first lecture I ever gave in 1957 at Hunter College, where I was really nervous. I was just, uh, on top of which I looked to be about 14. <laughs> and uh, I wrote out in actual words, and I got up before the class. I, in fact, I didn't even stand up at first. I sat in the class as they were all coming in, wait, you know, and then when the bell rang, I got myself up and walked to the front and picked up this paper, paper and I said, my name is, and I actually read everything. I did not leave one word. And then gradually, it was within the first few weeks, I got completely stuck presenting a point from Heraclitus. I started, you know, and I was just beginning teaching, I got completely mixed up. And you get in one of those situations where your sentence never ends. And you watch your mouth doing this and you can't think, you know, what happened to your mouth? You're still going on and you can't find a period to this thing. <laughs> and it was a very, uh, very unhappy situation. And then I stopped finally in the middle and I said, I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a message? 
And uh, I started the point over again and uh, was able to do it the second time. Students will really accept anything if you tell them, you know, that directly. In fact, they like you to be confused at times because then they feel, you know, there's not that big a distance. <laughs> yes? Uh, do you have any thoughts on class size and uh, how students should be grouped within a class that is by ability, age, well, I, I definitely think students should be grouped by ability so far as it's feasible and possible and by previous level of cognition, not rigorously by age, so long as you can find a way of administrating it that doesn't make, you know, a kid who is 12 but not fully as bright as everybody else set in with five-year-olds because that does irreparable damage to him. So you have to approximately grade by age with you know, accessory classes for the very slow uh, or the very fast. As far as the size of the class, I am not an advocate of necessarily one-on-one -on -one teaching. I don't think there's a problem with 25 or 30 uh, by the method that I advocate, because it's so controlled by the teacher anyway. And there's no problem with keeping tabs on 30 kids, I don't think. And it's administratively much cheaper, much more practical. Uh, and I think that when the kid is just uh, five and six and ten, it's too young for one-on-one. -on -one. Really, it's not, it's like using a steamroller, you know, too soon. So I don't see a problem with that. I have had this method, believe it or not, with classes, well, this size or larger. We're in a huge amphitheater, and I'll lecture for 15 minutes and then have class discussion. You know, controlled, and uh, uh, I found that it was not significantly different in terms of educational efficacy, whether I had 530 or, or 400. The big problem with 400 is I couldn't see the hands, you know, waving. So they had to hold flags and move their, you know, <laughs> so on. But other than that, uh, put it this way, I don't think the solution to our problems is small class size. I think that's one of those modern superficialities uh, that are not significant. Um, yes. Um, can you elaborate on the reason for stopping at age 15 and the normal student not needing to be taught formally later philosophy, arts, psychology, and economics? And secondly... Well, one at a time. You, you've had already 19 questions, so let's take that one. Can I elaborate on the reasons for stopping at 15? Well, first of all, 15 is not set in concrete. I'm open. I say the mid-teens. I do not, and my reason for that is very simple. There's not that much they have to learn. Any proper education, if you, particularly someone was telling me the other day that it's feasible to start at two and a half. If so, I drop it to 14 or 13. A decade of proper teaching is enough for the human mind. It simply is if it's properly taught. To be guided from the outside, to acquire the essentials of the areas we mentioned and to learn the methods of thinking. That doesn't mean he won't go on learning. It's enough for what I'm talking about, formal education. It's not true that the more the better, because there does come a point where it's valuable to learn on your own. And my idea of these higher subjects, like philosophy and economics and so on, they would be handled in one of two ways. I see nothing against in the last year of high school, or even the last two years, especially if the kids go up to 15 or 16, giving them this level of subject matter because by then they have the hierarchical preparation and they have the thinking methods. So sure, why not throw it in and orient them uh, to these subjects and so on. Uh, I don't think they're necessary for college. But the other thing I think is, these are ideally subjects to learn by reading. There is something to be said for learning by reading. I, I wouldn't want to oppose that. There's a tremendous amount you can get. But my whole point is this, the whole error of American education, well not the whole because it's all error, but the error is the reversal. They want little kids to become researchers. You know, oh no, we mustn't force anything, let Johnny follow his own bent and look up things himself and Johnny should read the Declaration of Independence, God forbid we should summarize it for him because that's second hand. That is, that is absurd. But it is true that when Johnny grows up, and he knows the basic principles, and he knows thinking, and he is in charge of his mind, then you say to him, look, you want to learn philosophy? You don't have to take more courses. You can if you want. There can be adult education. You take college if you can afford it. Good luck to you, but you don't have to. You can now think 
You can now read the stuff on your own in a properly graded series. That's the point at which you don't need a lecturer to take you by the hand anymore, you see. So I'm a great advocate of options and freedom and all those slogans of American research. If it comes after school, I'm not during. Sam, yes. Yes, training in teachers' colleges is mandated by law. All, what, what types? All teachers. Everybody who teaches has to have a degree in education in the undergraduate, in the grade schools. It's you, not if I, no, you don't need a teacher's de degree for college because only for one reason. They regard communication with the students in colleges beneath contempt. Colleges are regarded as research institu institutions. And the professors are paid and promoted according to the articles that they get published in scholarly journals. The students are just fodder to keep the thing going. And therefore, they would, never, they would think that they dignified teaching much too much to require professors to know how to do it, which is what they think is taught in teacher's training. So it's only by the combination of corruptions that we escape that uh, uh, particular one. Yes. Uh, you were saying earlier, I think it was yesterday or something, that uh, in a free society, you wouldn't, there wouldn't be such thing as having to have a PhD. I would certainly subscribe to that, yes. What's question? Is that your question? Yeah. That's it? Well, uh, could you explain it? Oh. Why do I think in a free society you wouldn't have to have a PhD? This is a question of terminology. A PhD, as it's now understood, is an obstacle course to eliminate people who don't have stamina and to supply employment for hordes of otherwise idle specialists in useless fields. <laughs> and PhD is, was copied from the German uh, approach. And the idea of it is, first you get them through 10 or 12 or whatever years of grade school. Then you get them through four years of undergraduate school. Then you get them through a few more years to get a master's degree. At this point, they're old, they're broken. <laughs> they're just about ready to collapse. You give them another three years, and you demand of them an incredibly long dissertation in which they have no interest and are not allowed to think in doing. And if that doesn't finish them off, then they can emerge and become a member of the Brotherhood. Now, this is, this is you think that's wrong, you try it and see. If you think that's a, an exaggeration. Now, in some fields, it may be better. I'm talking in the humanities and social sciences. There is no educational necessity for that. Everything you need to know about philosophy, you could learn, as far as learning it, educationally from someone else, you can learn in a few years, properly taught in college if you wanted to become a philosopher. And thereafter, you have to do it on your own. The idea, like I went to graduate school for 10 years. Now, partly that's because I kept being revolted and leaving and coming back. But even so, the number of courses and seminars and dissertations and theses and languages was absurd. It, it was simply laughably senseless. Uh, and uh, uh, I just don't think that there's any educational necessity for it. Now, in a free country, if you wanted to start a college and have a PhD or two of them, I don't care. If you could find people and you could demonstrate that you know, you were teaching something of value and they would pay you for it, good luck. I would venture to say, though, that you wouldn't succeed. There would not be enough of a demand to sustain it. Uh, because there's no human need for it that I see. At the back, yes. Uh, for planning your workload as a teacher, how much time would you allot for grading a student's essay and for consulting with them individually? How much time do you allot for grading a student's paper and consulting with them? Well, it's hard to answer that. It depends how many students you have, how much time uh, you have, and what his requirements are. I try, I mean, I couldn't give you an exact time. I've had classes, for instance, on the graduate level where I have a dozen students, where I would try to see each approximately one hour a week privately to try to find out what they're doing, how they're learning, including grading their papers and so on. But if you have, like I've had also 350, then it's out of the question. They just have to turn over to grading assistants. And there, all you can do is pick out the extremes. In other words, if somebody is perpetually asleep, 
knows nothing, and thinks that ancient Greeks are old men living in Athens, which exists. Well, as soon as you pick that up, you should talk to him. You know, find out why is he here? You know, is there a problem? On the other hand, the most important is to find the really bright students. Those are the ones that I give the most time to. The ones that ask good questions. I'm very bad on remembering faces and names, but I'm good at remembering questions. And like 20 years later, someone will say, you taught me so and so, and I have the faintest recollection, but he'll say, I was the one who asked this, and I'll still remember if it was a good question. And I, I attached all my you know, focus on that. And wherever I think they're bright, they're active, and they're really making you know, good progress, and there's not many in, in any given class that are really in that category, I go out of my way, simply in the hope, I mean, it's purely selfish, it's more pleasurable to talk to them, and they get more out of it, and who knows, maybe somebody good uh, would come out of it. So it's hard for me to give you like 15 minutes per student per course, I couldn't give an answer on those terms. Yes. Um, do you think the student protest paradigm of the 1960s was caused primarily by the, the colleges lowering their standards and letting too many students on campus, or was it caused primarily by uh, the education they received in the primary grades? The second. Well, do I think that the uh, college protest of the 60s was caused primarily by low entrance requirements or primarily by low education? Definitely the second, because the entrance requirements are still lower now. Uh, than they were then, and things are not as bad, simply because it's politically unfeasible right now. They feel, you know, these kids today, the bad ones, are so short-range, and once a Republican is in, they feel it's a malevolent universe and there's no hope, so they just simply give up because the next election is years away. Who could even think of that? You know, so to these kids, it's over now. The time of protest is over, and you better obey society because life is against us. If and when a Democrat gets in, a left-wing Democrat, they'll all be back. But right now, they're, they're chasing and they feel there is uh, no hope. But the real problem is, of course, the quality of the education. Uh, uh, that, that's what leads to the low entrance requirements to begin with, because the kids are so badly educated that if they had a high entrance requirements, you'd have to close the colleges anyway. No one could get into them. Uh, so the main problem is these kids are badly educated. They can't think. They have 10 years of this or 12 in grade school. And then they come on campus and the professors tell them, you know, they feel confused and mixed up and chaotic. And the professors tell them, you're the victims of a racist, oppressive society. This is your chance to be moral and so on. Strike out at the forces. And they get that in every class in, in some form, you know. And as they're right, but there's no wonder in the world that they go marching in the streets. You know, uh, read Ayn Rand's article on the Berkeley Student Rebellion for the deeper uh, roots, or read the Comprachicos, which is a terrific example of uh, uh, what's going on. Now, I'll try to restrict it to urgent questions, because this is the last few minutes of the entire thing, so this is your last chance. Yes? Uh, Dr. Peacock, there's no doubt that in the long run, the education of the youth that you're trying to do is the Rational philosophy is the ultimate answer to changing society and history. But do you think that in the short run, it is useful to present to uh, adults uh, uh, some rational education to deal with the irrational issues that are springing up? Well, why do what for? I'm thinking of, uh, say, sending specific trained intellectual warriors out into someone who has an interest, say, in, uh, in civil rights or to deal, to bring rational values right to that area. Well, let me, let me answer you. The question is, do, uh, granted that long-range philosophic training is the ultimate solution, can't short-range education help by sending specific rational speakers to various adult groups? And I'd answer you this way. Every little bit helps. Any one person or group that you can teach any one good idea to, to that extent helps. But it's a question of what are your resources and what are your priorities. And uh, I don't think any one hit and run thing like that makes that much difference. I don't say don't do it. But if it's an issue of priorities, I think we have to 
focus on educating a core of intellectuals. That's the wholesale method, who will then spread ideas through the whole school system, rather than if I heard you say women's groups or abortion groups or whichever. I don't say that's harmful. It can be helpful. It's just a question of uh, priorities. Do you think you have time, though? I mean, can you If we time? don't have time, you say, do we have time? Ayn Rand was asked that question in 1934. Conservatives at that time said to her, she said, we need a new philosophy. They said, we don't have time. Look what Roosevelt is doing. He's destroying the country. We've got to go into political action now. It's too late. They have been saying that for the last 50 years. We haven't got time for philosophy. Uh, there is no way to short circuit. If it is true that we don't have time, we're not going to make up the deficit by converting a women's group to anything. So if we don't have time, we have to throw in the towel. But my attitude is, let's hope there's time and do what has to be done. It's just like saying, you know, we don't have time to cure this disease, but we'll give him an aspirin. Now, he's going to die tomorrow anyway, but at least, you know, he won't have a headache when he dies. I, I don't want to make this back and forth because I have a written question on education. And, it, and then, George, are we near our end? Or? Uh, as part of your motivation, you said that we could find out where our own education was lacking and then know what needs remedy, and thus know what needs remedy. I see serious holes, H-O-L-E-S, he spelled it out, in my education. Question, what can one do late in life to correct a poor education, given that one now has the time, money, and motivation. And where would this be done? Well, that's a great question, and I'm morally obligated to answer, since I did offer that as a motivation. I wish I knew the answer. To begin with, I would pick my spots. I would not try, if you're an adult, employed full-time with a job, to go and recreate the entire curriculum. I'll say we rather than you. We are too old for that now. You don't have the time, the leisure, or the flexibility. You can get a partial value, though, depending on your interests. Now, if you're scientifically oriented, go in that direction. But for the normal person, I would say, forget about science and math. No use trying to make that up, and it won't be unavoidable. Because by one means or another, you stumbled on a good philosophy. So you can get a lot from that that you wouldn't be getting from them. And they are tremendously time consuming on their own. Much harder to get on your own than the humanities, because they're very technical, very specialized. It's much easier to understand even Hegel than uh, you know, geometry. And uh, from that point of view, if you're weak in science and math, put it on the back burner. Get to it when you're 70. I would say if you want to remedy your education, we're talking curricular here because methodology, I can't do anything for you except study epistemology. But if you're talking about curricular gaps, concentrate on history and literature. Those are the two most accessible for an adult trying to repair the damage. But do it in an appropriate way. In other words, don't get Toynbee's multi-volume set on the history of the world and sit down with the ancient Sumerians because you'll never get past it. <laughs> Take some reasonable, modest assignment, like maybe uh, American, uh, America in the 18th century, and read something, some reputable, now don't ask me what's reputable, ask, write Palo Alto Book Service. Bob Hessen knows every book that was ever written <laughs> That's good or bad, and he will tell you. Uh, the only way I ever know what book to read is ask him. So you can call him up, as I told people, and say, I want to know about uh, Abyssinian bath mats. And he'll say, the best treatise is Schleiermacher, 1874, <laughs> off the top of his head. So um, but get a decent book on American history, or on the Renaissance, or on ancient Greece, and make a start. Get an idea. And then take a bad period, take the medieval period, or take uh, modern Germany or something. Get a beginning of an idea, and then you can start to take maybe a, a general introduction, and you can do it by reading. The same is true with literature. 
plunge into something more or less accessible. The Odyssey is easier than the Iliad, if you wanted to start there, or uh, uh, Antigone is more accessible, or some of Shakespeare's plays are easier than others. It's not so horrifying. Or start some, take some French romantics. Take a Rostand or Hugo, or read Dostoevsky, or whatever. Just plunge in somewhere and try to get some ideas of what this is about, what its ideas are, how it's written, and so on, and then go somewhere else. And you can be like Gail Wine. There doesn't have to be any order in what you take in, but there'll be order in what remains.